So I'm going to be talking about this question of can cities talk? And, and you've heard about this whole discussion around the internet of things. How do you enable sensors? How do you generate all these new pieces of data and information? And then kind of interact with the city, have the city talk to you, have you engage with the city, if you will. And one of the, the most significant aspects of that right now is, believe it or not, in the realm of parking. Uh, and I've been wanting to work in the parking industry since I was about three. That's actually not true. It was supposed to be a joke. It didn't work. That's okay. I'll get you on the next one. So here's the thing. Uh, the presentation from Noreen and, uh, uh, and uh, Patrick was very good, except, sorry for this, it was only half of the puzzle. Okay? Um, historically, everybody has looked at traffic. It takes you 14.2 minutes to get from point A to point B. That's what Waze will tell you. Everybody else will tell you, Nokia, Google, and so on. The problem is, point B is not your ultimate destination. You can't stop your car outside a restaurant. You can't stop your car out as a business say, I'm here. That's it. Map said 14.2 minutes. It's 14.2 minutes. You actually have to go park your car. Your real destination is point C. And it's that second piece of the puzzle that historically nobody's taken a look at. Parking was the thing that you know some person sitting in a little booth took tickets and everybody complained about it. But now we are rethinking parking. We're reimagining what this very important uh, piece of the puzzle can become. Uh, parking is typically the second or third largest source of revenue for a city. It's usually one of the biggest uses of real estate in a city. So it's a very strategic thing. Uh, and I'm sure that all of you have had trouble finding parking, so it's a big consumer thing. So I'm going to go through and, and, and tell you how we, can, how we can solve that problem. So parking meter was created in 1935 in the US. And this is kind of one of those actual first streets, and people were very happy, and now you can pay, uh, you know, pay money for it. Now we're in 2013. Big advancement, you would think? Not so much. Okay. Um, now this is the US. Uh, still 60 to 70% of the meters in the US are coin operated. You have to go put and change. Now there's uh, credit card meters. People are using mobile payments. In Europe and Asia, mobile payments are more prevalent. But the basic message here is that parking as an industry has kind of been asleep as the rest of the world, from a technology perspective, has been continuing on. So you can use your iPhone app to go find a spot. You can use Yelp to check on the restaurant. You can use things like OpenTable to make a restaurant reservation. And you do all of these fancy things on your app, and then you drive around, and you drive around, and you drive around, and you drive around. And then your wife says, no, turn left. You say, no, it's turn right. And you have an argument. We can solve that as well, by the way. And you drive around. So not much has changed in the parking industry. Um, now, for cities and universities, um, this, as I said, is a real estate asset. It's an asset that really hasn't been managed. Significant source of revenue associated with it. The congestion piece of it is very real. Uh, obviously, there's highway congestions. But you know, guess what? Cars only do two things. Uh, they drive. <laughs> And that's the congestion on the road. And they stop. And when they stop, that's the parking piece of it. And that earlier metric, about 30%, in New York City, it's estimated to 40 to 45% of that traffic. Uh, and of course, a significant environmental uh, impact as well. So when you solve that problem. So these are two pieces of the coin, the, the traffic that happens on the street and how do you solve the parking piece of it. For drivers, of course, a huge source of frustration. You know, you're in that traffic jam, you come out, you search for the parking, that's an issue. There's actually a real economic cost as well. Uh, for those of you obviously in Sao Paulo, but if you go to London as well, many other cities, you can't have more than two meetings in a day because you can't get from one place to another place. So big issue there. Uh, and you will miss things, right? You, again, you estimate that 14.2 minutes, and then you miss it. Right? For merchants, this is a big issue because your consumer, your, your customer, has to find a parking spot before they come into your shop or your business. Now, some people solve it through valet parking. And you know that you pay that extra $20, $30 to, to valet park. So for businesses, as we've gone into cities, the businesses and the merchants become a very important part of that puzzle. And, and how do you solve that? So this is kind of one of our standard slides, not the nice, pretty one. But this is essentially what we're doing in terms of rethinking parking. We obviously provide guidance to an open parking spot uh, we also work on the enforcement side. Um, think about local merchant offers. As you're getting close to a spot, you start getting different, uh, different offers with different merchants. Uh, you can start making reservations in garages. 
So imagine you have your 9 a.m. meeting, you make a reservation in a parking garage, you get there at 845, there's a spot available for you. And, and of course, mobile payments, and at some point, you have to integrate traffic information because you're talking about end-to-end -end destination management. So this is a little bit of a, of, of a heavy slide, but, but how do we do this is we actually put sensors on the ground in each parking spot. It's a little disk. Uh, Siemens is a partner of ours, and they deploy the sensors. They can go put out five to 600 sensors in a day. Then you have a mesh network on top of it that communicates the data and information. It's very easy to deploy. Uh, we can have uh, you know, three, four, 5,000 sensors up and running in two weeks. So the physical deployment of it is very straightforward. Um, one new thing is these two white boxes and the, uh, the other one there is we haven't gotten into this business yet, but now that smart parking has really become one of those killer apps for cities, we're starting to look at other use cases underneath that mesh network. So pollution sensors, sensors in fire hydrants, sound sensors, other things that can be extended and used. The sensor itself is not that complicated. The problem becomes is how do you get that data and information out? So this is one of, now once we get all that data and information, the magic is actually in the information and, and what do you do with it? So Streetline has built a series of applications on top, uh, both for cities on how to manage data and information, for consumers, if you have an iPhone or an Android phone, there's an app called Parker, P-E-R-K-E-R, you can download that. This is one of the things that you get as part of that app. This is showing you the real-time data. Uh, in, well, this is a slide, obviously, but you can see the real-time data in any space, in any spot, all the time. Um, this is analytics, so imagine knowing on every block, every second of the day, what that data and information is. Then you can start doing things like dynamic pricing. You have congestion management for traffic, you can start doing dynamic pricing. Uh, for that. Now, from a consumer perspective, here's the issue. Um, and, uh, and Rand made this point. There, there's just so much physical infrastructure that's available. You can't add more parking spots. The problem is one of information. The problem is not one of more physical infrastructure. And the issue is that a motorist has three choices when he or she kind of gets to that point. Take a left, take a right, go straight. And what Streetline does, seeks to do, is influence that point to decide whether you take a left, whether you take a right. Now, on the example on the left, the person did not have access to Parker. They drove around. They eventually got to the parking spot. The lady on the right had access to Parker, knew exactly where that spot is, and was able to go there. And that really, it works today, and, and it makes a big difference. So, and I love the title of, of the presentation today on you know, what works. This is something that has been deploying today. We're in 35 plus cities. I'm going to rush through some of the, the examples right now. So we're in Los Angeles, 9,000 spaces, downtown Los Angeles, Hollywood. You can find a parking spot in one or two minutes. The city is completely rethinking how they manage parking. Dynamic pricing, smarter enforcement. It becomes a strategic asset rather than something on the side. Uh, we're now deploying in New York City. We did an event with uh, Mayor Bloomberg two, three weeks ago. We're starting off in the Bronx and we'll be expanding to other parts of New York City. But it doesn't have to be just large cities. It can be smaller cities, uh, tourist destinations, uh, small towns, Palo Alto, where I live in California, where there's a lot of activity, but only in a you know, 10, 15 uh, block area, uh, if you will. Analytics, policy management uh, becomes critical. Uh, we're now going international. Uh, Birmingham, Manchester in the UK. We're working with Siemens in, uh, in Germany. That becomes very critical. We did, I know Cisco is a big sponsor of this project. Uh, they are an important partner. We did two projects with them in San Mateo and San Carlos in, in, uh, in California as well. So universities. Universities are like small towns. Uh, I have the privilege of teaching at Stanford University as well. You know, try finding parking there and getting to a class on time. It's, it's very difficult to do. Uh, and finally, transit stations. We're working with the Washington, D.C. metro system. You know how many parking spots they are, where they are, before you take that exit to get to the, uh, uh, get to the road. So... Um, you know, it's, uh, it's been pretty interesting over the last two years, and I joined um, uh, Streetland about two and a half years ago. Uh, there's been this explosion of interest in, in, in smart parking, um, and the, the publicity has been amazing, and I think it's because it's a topic that touches so many different people, the citizens, the merchants, uh, the cities, because of the revenue associated with it, uh, and that's obviously been, uh, been great. So I'd like to kind of end off with... Um, with a short video, and I'm sure you'll recognize this gentleman um, a little more than you maybe recognize me. But 
I actually truly believe, and in the short video you'll see, try and really pay attention to the words uh, that, that uh, Steve Jobs will share here. I think we are at, at a historic point where because of the confluence of technology, because of the number of people moving into urban centers, um, it's not only a possibility, but it's almost a requirement for us to rethink how we've done things in the past. Uh, Streetline and our work is focused on one piece of it, which is parking. But the, the sessions and the conversations that are happening here have to think differently uh, and have to approach problems from a completely new perspective. So take a look at this, and then I'll make just one last comment. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. That's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it, you can influence it, you can, you can build your own things that other people can use. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. So this influenced me a lot. I hope it will influence you as well. And thank you very much for your time.